I think we can all agree. This world has a lot of problems. And it seems like every time we try to fix one of them, our solutions inadvertently create others. Perhaps none more so than the problem of too many people. I know, today some things just aren't discussed. But until about 20 years ago, population growth was a topic at the forefront of almost every conversation involving climate, security, and women's empowerment? Why and when? Where and how did too many people become the key issue focused on by so many great minds and cultural icons of this past century? Well, in our series, we've discussed Malthusianism, explored eugenics, behavioral control, and the institutional mechanism of expertise. But now it's time to follow those rabbit holes back to the beginning and watch as our timeline unfolds. In 1877, the Malthusian League was established during an age of social and political reform unlike the world had ever seen. New governments were still finding their footing while old kingdoms sought a future where their new nations hopefully wouldn't end in another civil war or revolution. Labor unions were rising up as a prominent voice calling for workers' rights in an ongoing discussion about improving the quality of life for the lower classes. Meanwhile, Malthusians argued that overpopulation is clearly to blame for the miserable reality which was being born poor in the 19th century. And in most well-educated minds, Malthus's population principle had long been established as both an economic and ethical framework that pretty well explained war, famine, and disease to be the natural and predictable outcome of surplus populations. A disturbing reflection of its influence can be observed this very same year, when private charity efforts to curb the famine in India were being discouraged for the same reasons they had been during the Irish famine a generation earlier. You see, to them, death was the inevitable result of a landmass supporting too much life. Thereby, allowing the preventable starvation of millions was a moral act considered necessary for the greater good of future generations. However, the Malthusian League was presenting a new and revolutionary idea called family planning, which essentially meant preventing these poor souls from being born rather than condemning them to a life of suffering before their inevitable death from war, famine, or disease. This population control initiative marks what seems to be the institutional origin of what's called Neo-Malthusianism, a movement which had already been well underway throughout most of academia. For 50 years, this league would work diligently across multiple continents to develop and circulate educational materials on birth control and population management, as Neo-Malthusianism quickly established its place in a society already enveloped by Herbert Spencer's concept of social Darwinism. In the late 19th century, it had been as if the word survival of the fittest gave society a scientific explanation or, at the very least, an explanation from a credible scientist as to why the few had so much while so many had so little. And the idea of population control, after watching millions die horrible deaths of starvation, well, just seemed humane. A few years later, eugenics would epitomize both ideas. But I do feel it's important to acknowledge that these three concepts, though often lumped together, are actually different things. This world is full of ists and isms that help us define what is and isn't. Among many others, the late 19th century would see the rise of natural selection, known today as Darwinism. Charles Darwin's observation on evolution may have given scientists a new evidence-based outline for life on Earth outside of any god or religion, but T.H. Huxley gave it a name. Not only did he coin the term Darwinism and successfully defend natural selection from the Anglican Church, but he also introduced the term agnosticism. It was meant to define those who can't claim belief in God, as do the religious, or that there is no God, as do the atheist, because agnostics believe there is a lack of substantial evidence for either position. The 19th century would also give rise to conservationism and see the founding of the Sierra Club, an institutional champion of neo-Malthusianism in America that would shepherd in the later environmentalist movement to come. By the early 20th century, mankind was stretching out. Life expectancy had almost doubled, and traveling great distances was no longer such a tremendous burden. This rate of unparalleled expansion culminated into the First World War, 
which brought about the death of millions, the toppling of an empire, and the creation of a League of Nations determined to unite the world. It was the dawn of internationalism, a relatively new concept which stood in sharp contrast to the national fervor created by the war effort. Whether in propaganda or basic education, generations growing up in this time period were deliberately conditioned to love their country, honor their flag, and protect their culture and traditions from any and all foreign invaders. Meanwhile, internationalists viewed borders as insignificant relics from an old and outdated concept of the world. This new League of Nations would soon form the Institute for Intellectual Cooperation, a precursor to UNESCO that would also be headed up by a then much younger Julian Huxley, who had already reached a high level of academic and professional prominence before becoming a British intelligence officer during the war. In 1922, Julian's classmate and renowned Oxford scholar, Carr Saunders, published The Population Problem, a study in human evolution, and examination questioning genetic quality versus quantity in a war-torn Europe being quickly outgrown. Of course, at this time, eugenics was already highly popular and had inspired multiple policies in various nations across the world. But those policies focused more on pruning the gene pool than curbing population growth. Five years later, in 1927, the League of Nations would host the first World Population Conference in Geneva, Switzerland. Here, Julian Huxley explains to us how the event came together. In the mid-twenties, Margaret Sanger came over to Europe to gain support for her cause and saw me as well as H.G. Wells and other sympathizers. I was only too ready to give her my name and was quite won over by her ardent zeal and common sense. One result of her visit was the foundation of the first birth control clinic in England by Marie Stopes. So far, the emphasis had been on the need to help individual women avoid the misery of unwanted pregnancies and the burden of large families. But now, under pressure from myself and many others, the birth control movement, still with Margaret Sanger at the helm, began to lay increasing stress on the dangers of overpopulation. She organized a World Population Conference at Geneva in 1927 and again enlisted my help. She managed to get the laws against birth control repealed in many states of the U.S., set up a Population Reference Council as a study group and powerful lobbying agency in Washington, and eventually, in 1952, helped to found the International Planned Parenthood Federation, which now has branches all over the world. In 1927, the Malthusian League would dissolve after 50 years of advocacy and education towards birth control efforts and family planning, as the struggle against overpopulation was now being adopted by the champions of women's rights. At that same time, Julian Huxley and H.G. Wells were busy working on a new installment of what Wells called in his 1928 novel, The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution, a group of writings to embody the necessary idea of the new times in a form adapted to the current reading public. A sort of provisional Bible, so to speak. This modern Bible scheme has taken a threefold form. First, in a full and then compacter book, The Outline of History, this furnishes a framework of fact within which general political ideas of the reader can be put in order. It presents the history of life as a progress from fragmentation towards world unity. The next installment of the series would be an almost encyclopedic accounting of the state of biological understanding in ecology which, at the time, was a newly emerging interdisciplinary perspective viewing all of life as one connected system and offering guidance towards solving the greater problems facing man. The dead weight of inferior population may overpower the constructive few, or the incalculable run of climatic changes may turn harshly against him. Continuing in the subchapter entitled Life Under Control, the progressive development of the scientific mind may survive all the blundering wars, social disorganization, misconceptions, and suppressions that still seem to lie before mankind. But he will survive on one condition, and that is, he must take control not only of his own destinies, but of the whole of life. By that time, the body of modern science will be enormously greater and more closely knit than it is today. At present, the full extent of the decline of the birth rate of most civilized countries is masked by the prolongation of the average life due to better hygienic conditions. 
This may go on for quite some time, and it may involve the elimination of types unwilling to bear and rear children. To have a world encumbered for a time with an excess of sterile jazz dancers and joyriders may be a pleasanter way to elimination than hardship and death. Concluding, pleasure may achieve what force and sword have failed to. Now, if all this talk of the Malthusian League and sterile pleasure seekers is starting to sound a little bit like Brave New World, that's probably because Brave New World was greatly inspired by Aldous Huxley's time in a cabin helping his brother Julian write this book. But I digress. By 1927, eugenics had long since gained academic prominence through ample funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, along with several other philanthropic institutions and industrialists who had now spent decades pouring money into eugenic organizations, social programs, and academic establishments all over the world. Of course, this is up to and including the soon-to-be infamous Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Eugenics in Germany. You see, during this period, existing birth control programs were almost entirely aimed at building stronger nations. Each targeted and eliminated certain genetic factors and at times even called for the compulsory sterilization of entire gene pools. Of course, by this time eugenic policies had been implemented internationally, but it was the U.S. leading the way by establishing sterilization as a measure of public health and safety, as demonstrated here in 1927 by Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Unfortunately, by the mid-1930s, there had already been two centuries of investment, multiple fields of study, and entire views of life built upon the only recently disproven concept of genetic race. It was at this time Julian Huxley was commissioned with Carr Saunders to debunk multiple claims being made by Hitler and other proponents of racialized eugenics. Their book was called We Europeans, and in it, the authors examine the concept of race, explaining how and why it is inaccurate, and since differences are mostly cultural, suggest the term ethnic group should be adopted instead. Ultimately, their work failed to derail the advancement of Hitler's vision, and the inescapable shadow of war once again enveloped the world. By late 1944, the war was all but won. Julian had been asked to assume the duties of Director General for the new United Nations Education and Cultural Organization, a position he accepted but requested science be added as a central focus, and thus the founding of UNESCO was underway. With the death of Hitler and defeat of Germany in 1945, the true extent of atrocities committed by racialized eugenics finally began coming to light. These National Socialists had sterilized somewhere in the ballpark of a half million people, euthanized tens of thousands, and brutally imprisoned and murdered millions more. The scale of these and other genocidal crimes during World War II cast the previously well-respected eugenics under a bright and rather unforgiving spotlight beneath which it was forced to rebrand as supporters of self-directed evolution grew tired of defending themselves publicly from accusations of being a Nazi, though in truth many did support Hitler prior to the war. Throughout the world, once prominent institutions were now dissolving, as eugenic scientists, including actual Nazis, had been quietly reshuffled into new government and privately funded institutions, like cards out on a table being cut into new decks. Meanwhile, a series of strategic conferences had been hosted at destination resorts and historic landmarks to establish a new global currency system, a World Bank to help fund rebuilding and development, and an official International Administrative Authority Center that would unite all nations under a new global order. By 1948, both UNESCO and the World Health Organization became official UN embodiments of old League of Nations frameworks, each still focused on implementing neo-Malthusian education material and healthcare policies across the globe. And while Julian himself publicly defended the principles of eugenics, he also understood how much damage had truly been done. 
So, in its place, he proposed evolutionary humanism to carry forward eugenic goals through a scientifically based moral foundation upon which a new unifying culture could be established for the entire world to share. A few years later, Julian would achieve knighthood, found major international organizations, and also preside over the merger of other separate pre-existing scientifically based ethical societies into a new, unified humanist association, of which, of course, he was made president. Also in charge of the British Eugenics Society, Sir Julian would remain active in population control efforts throughout his long life, championing both eugenic and Malthusian principles by way of evolutionary humanism, and eventually coining the term transhumanism to describe the process of mankind intentionally evolving beyond itself. After the war, things had gotten good. In fact, many worried they might be a little too good. Perhaps none more so than John D. Rockefeller III, who, in 1952, founded the Population Council alongside his equally wealthy and well-connected counterpart, American Eugenics Society and Population Association America founder, Frederick Osborne. That same year, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, as well as a billion-dollar population program from the Ford Foundation, would emerge alongside Fred, Catherine, Hugh and several other obscenely wealthy and well-connected financiers who'd spend the next decade cultivating the necessary personnel to implement policy change. Finally, by 1967, all the pieces had fallen into place. So John called for a special meeting at the UN headquarters he had helped build only 20 years earlier at which the eldest Rockefeller would now implore leaders of the world to address this population problem by way of long-term coordinated planning. Luckily, some of these historic moments have been recorded on film, so we can go back in time and witness them for ourselves. As heads of governments actively concerned with the population problem, we share these convictions. We believe that the population problem must be recognized as a principal element in long-range national planning if governments are to achieve their economic goals and fulfill the aspirations of their people. We believe that lasting and meaningful peace will depend to a considerable measure upon how the challenge of population growth is met. We believe that the objective of family planning is the enrichment of human life, not its restriction. That family planning, by assuring greater opportunity to each person, frees man to attain his individual dignity and reach his full potential. That declaration will increasingly be recognized, so I am sure, as a decisive document in history. And while we rejoice in this advance, we should think today of how much has to be done to make up for lost time. We try to understand the meaning of statistics of world population growth, statistics which measure misery in millions. But what we now hear in terms of terrifying statistics has long been known in terms of human suffering and human degradation. The price of past blindness and complacency has been paid by those least able to understand and least able to protest, by the poor and by the illiterate, and especially by bewildered women and unwanted and neglected children. And now I give the floor to the distinguished Secretary General who has spread his wish to make a declaration in this act. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to receive this declaration on population growth and human dignity and welfare. I want to express my particular appreciation to Mr. John D. Rockefeller III, Chairman of the Board, both of the Population Council and of the Rockefeller Foundation, 
and who is with us here this morning for his untiring efforts to secure ever wider acceptance of the Declaration. This document has now been signed by 29 heads of state or government, as just announced by the Chairman and the Distinguished Representative of the United Kingdom. There are important links between population growth and the implementation of the rights and freedoms proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The work of the United Nations itself in the population field has so far been relatively limited given the importance of the problem. Against this background, I invited in July of last year governments, non-governmental organizations and private individuals to contribute to a new trust fund for population activities. We are concerned with the number of human beings on earth. We bear an immense responsibility for the quality of human life in future generations. I have no doubt that we can succeed. Man has shown increasing ability to master his environment. He is now acquiring the knowledge as well as the means to master himself and his own future. It is his duty to do so for his own sake and for the sake of succeeding generations to whom we must bequeath a life worthy of human beings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished Secretary General for his words. In this manner, I put an end to this act in which it has been publicized the decision taken by 17 governments to add their signatures to the Declaration on Population Growth and Welfare. And with the sound of that gavel began a whole new chapter in the history of mankind, one that could now be controlled by man, or more specifically these men, and shortly after the declaration was accepted, both the World Bank and USAID made family planning an official requirement for any impoverished country seeking assistance. Almost overnight, the long-term goal of poverty reduction had become institutionally synonymous with reduced fertility. You see, some years ago, it had been calculated that in developing countries, every dollar invested in preventing a life would yield significant economic returns over the following decades. Originally, Participating governments had only been expected to permit education and demographic research, but now struggling leaders would be expected to fight poverty by taking an active role in significantly reducing birth rates in their impoverished country. Meanwhile in the West, the Sierra Club had published a new ecological update of Malthus's old catastrophe in terms of environmental crisis, demanding immediate action from governments to save this planet from us. Stockholm, Sweden, June 12, 1972. Mrs. Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India, arrived today to address the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. She was met by the Secretary General of the Conference, Mr. Maurice Strong, who escorted Mrs. Gandhi to the rostrum. It is clear that the environmental crisis which is confronting the world will profoundly alter the future destiny of our planet. No one amongst us, whatever our status, strength or circumstance, can remain unaffected. Ladies and gentlemen, everything is of concern to everybody in our deeply interdependent world today. The iron rule remains. Our world is one inseparable and interdependent. It is this world that is threatened by the impact of man's unplanned, selfish and ever-growing activities. No political system makes us immune to this threat. No level of economic development permits us to escape. We all face the challenge of equals, equally threatened, equally vulnerable. 
The crisis of human environment is a global crisis. I would not say I am disappointed. I think under the circumstances, four years after politicians in particular and people in general uh, began to realize we were in the middle of an environmental crisis, I think Maurice Strong has done an absolute miracle of even getting people to come here and putting together a, uh, this sort of conference. What we do have to do is put into the hands of the, indust of the more developing countries the levers of power uh, which they can use in bettering their bargaining position with us. Countries with but a small fraction of the world's population consume the bulk of the world's production of minerals, fossil fuels, and so on. Thus, we see that when it comes to the depletion of natural resources and environmental pollution, the increase of one inhabitant in an affluent country at his level of living is equivalent to an increase of many Asians, Africans, or Latin Americans at their current material levels of living. If poor nations are faced with the problem of growth within acceptable environmental limits, the rich nations are clearly caught up with it even more seriously. We're meeting in this worldwide conference largely because the evidence is now overwhelming that roughly a century of very rapid economic advance throughout the world has contributed to a monstrous assault on the quality of life in the developed countries. Who determines what determines quality of life? In the progressive era, Eugenics defined it in official terminology, outlining multiple levels of mental and genetic fitness. And somewhere, along their quest to reclassify and correct human existence by mastering nature, the coinciding emergence of philanthropic investment helped to accelerate several major breakthroughs that had unintentionally began tipping the balance of human population on Earth. You see, advancements in chemical engineering, hygiene, and medical treatment had collectively extended human lifespans at the very same time birth rates were exploding into an era called the baby boom. John D. Rockefeller III lived the last half of his life witnessing this unprecedented phenomenon unfold, all the while feeling partially to blame for the consequences wrought by his family's own attempt to solve these major problems that had been keeping human populations in check for centuries. Can one save too many lives? This is the question contemplated by philanthropists as they watch their hard work and good intentions disappear in the eyes of those suffering through the very same life they had just invested so much in trying to save. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of the Second Great War, academic administrators were being forced to reconcile with the fact genocide had just been carried out under the very same eugenic principles that, until now, had been balancing the ethical scales of population management policies throughout the world. Though official terminology changed over time, funding for population control still comes from many of the same sources as it did before Hitler. And in fact, the investment in population reduction increased substantially almost immediately after the end of World War II, as the UN stated mission for world peace would now be expressly pursued through international policies designed to address the very problem Malthus had so long ago observed to be the cause of war. For perspective, even if one includes the highest unsubstantiated estimates along with the official records of eugenic sterilization, they'd find the total number of eugenically sterilized people throughout all of history amounting to far less than even a single year in India since the UN's 1974 World Population Plan of Action had been introduced. Today, despite over 50 years of concentrated policy intervention, India's population is set to soon overtake China, whose own policies not only had a tremendous effect on slowing their country's birth rate and advancing economic development, but also raised new questions toward the morality of preventing so much life. Regardless of how valid an argument may be, some actions just seem beyond any justification of greater good. And one such example comes to us from 1975, as the United Nations Year of Population was giving way to a new decade of women. One year prior, 
Indira Gandhi was reportedly falling behind on benchmarks to qualify for India's next five-year investment cycle. So, only a few days after attending the First World Conference on Women, she would declare a state of emergency, suspend elections, and assume absolute authority to arrest and imprison political opponents, refuse trial for inmates, censor all forms of media, and eventually forcefully sterilize over six million of her poorest male citizens in an effort to reach planned goals without triggering backlash for trampling all over women's rights. You see, though it was officially signed into effect in 1974, the UN's Population Plan of Action didn't truly begin until the first women's conference. In Mexico City, where the International Women's Year Conference assembled, the major aim was to adopt a world plan of action. The plan would set the direction for governments to follow in bringing opportunity and equality to the women of the world. Through highly political arguments and meandering speeches, the diversities and common problems which exist in the world would be reflected in the exchanges of the next two weeks. Delegates were as diverse as the issues. They included a cosmonaut, wives of heads of state, and a woman prime minister. records from the time from the chief secretary of the government of Uttar Pradesh. Government attach highest importance to achievement of family planning targets. Failure to achieve monthly target will result in stoppage of salary suspension and severest penalties. Other states, all eligible cases for sterilization in my office and department have been sterilized. Persons who have refused to get themselves sterilized have not been paid their salaries. The evidence surely, Mrs. Gandhi, that a combination of intimidation, coercion, economic sanction, not giving people licenses, not giving people rights to free education and health and so on, were used by yes, officials were, throughout India to, 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 to force people, were. in effect, yes. to have sterilization. Yes, they were. Those are major, wide-scale excesses then, aren't they? No, I don't think so. Did you not concoct a threat to the survival of the state in order to ensure your own survival in I'm power? I'm sure that's a very rude question. Well, the Shah Commission, to which I must refer, because it was a commission set up by the government, it's a judicial inquiry, and he is an eminent judge, says that the only evidence he can find is the Allahabad judgment, and on the basis of that he says thousands were detained and a series of totally illegal and unwarranted actions followed involving untold human misery and suffering. That's why I put the question. I don't put it out of a desire to be rude to you, Mrs. Gandhi. The decision I took was ratified by the cabinet and by the parliament. It was not only accepted, it was applauded by the entire nation. Had we held the elections in 1976, we would have won hands down. Now, we did not hold the elections because the state of the economy was such at that time. The political situation was all right. But the state of the economy meant that we, had a, we could see that if we continued, we by, I don't mean us as people, but the policies we were pursuing, if they continued, we could give India a star, sound and stable economy. And furthermore, now people realize that if our population goes up at the rate it is, which is going, uh, their children won't be alive. They won't, have, uh, they won't have enough food or education or any of those rights. Do you accept no responsibility at all? I have accepted all responsibility because I happen to be head of the government. But you believe but there was no, mean, there was nothing... No, you see, you cannot be categorical about these things. Certainly mistakes, when you take up any major program, mistakes will take place. 